Welcome to Flesh and Pod, a flesh and blood podcast, breaking down weekly news and notes from the tournament scene, community drama, game strategy, and more. And now, here are your hosts, Derek and Logan. Hello, welcome to episode 157. I really should change it on the show notes. It still says 156. I guess I never got <laughs> that we did 156 already uh but episode 157 of flesh and pod my name is logan i'm your host uh with me as always i'm glad i'm not fucking ron burgundy over here because i would just sort of read that straight off the the teleprompter and just be like yeah go fuck yourself san diego but um i am logan my name is logan i'm your host and with me as always is charmer Derek oswald um what are you to thank mer tonight uh how was your holiday uh the the holiday was great because i didn't do anything oh i shouldn't say i didn't do anything i made the the main portion of our meal this year because we decided to not you know invite a bunch of people over we just did it at home and uh we made uh we say i say we i made but like we as a family had uh chicken lasagna oh. it's it's a, a meal that i make maybe once a year just because it takes a lot of prep time but also because it is very dense um filling wise calorically and i also can't stop eating it it is <laughs> like one of my favorite foods on the planet so knowing like that i have to say okay i'm only gonna like make this once a year so this year um we did it for thanksgiving and it, it was nice but yeah, yeah, I didn't didn't do anything else. We didn't go see family. Um, didn't do anything like big. We kind of just, you know, worked on the house a bit. Like we we set up some uh, holiday decorations, uh, prepping for Yule. My family celebrates Yule, so um, got a bunch of stuff around for that and, and ready to go. But otherwise, uneventful in the best of ways. You know. We take that. Uh, I went and I did spend some time with fa- with extended family, with my brother's family and my mom and stuff like that for Thanksgiving Day. And then I always cook a a meal for the household here because it's myself and my wife and then uh, two roommates who uh, will never leave. I'm pretty sure no matter how much they may ever want them to. Um, they're just here. And again, that's a joke, but. Although one did move in while I was out of the country, I was make sure to bring to put that one in there. I did not know he was moving in. I showed up from India and I had a roommate. Yeah, that's, a, that's how it works. Apparently, it is. If you vacate the no, continent, it's, um, it's India specifically. I have left oh, the continent okay. several times and came back with no problems. It, it's just India. Hmm. I would still go back. I I enjoyed myself thoroughly when I was there. Um, but then yesterday, my, if my voice starts ca- caving in, uh, so last night I was at the Iowa State football game. Uh, they secured their 10th win for the first time in program history. Um, they are now playing in the Big 12 uh, championship game on Saturday. It, as I was telling Derek, uh, in the, but when the fourth quarter started, it was about 16 degrees Fahrenheit. So I was frozen solid and still yelling at the top of my lungs. So today... To try to remedy the situation, I went and just had a bunch of hot pot. So the, the spiciest Tom Yum broth I could get and still added chili oil to it. Mm-hmm. Bunch of garlic and just, OK, cook me like purge all the bad out of me with fire. And it seems to have worked. I feel pretty good now. So, you know, that that went over well, apparently. But uh, for those that aren't U.S. based, and I know there are several of you that listen to this from other countries and welcome. Uh, we, this was a Thanksgiving holiday for um, the U.S. where it, we nominally celebrate um, the na- <laughs> I don't even know the fuck you want to say we celebrate anymore. We just celebrate gluttony. That's that's really the 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 gist of the holiday for most people. It also kicks off the holiday shopping season around here. So we also celebrate greed. Um, but mm-hmm. the the big thing is, you know, for most people is it's time to spend around friends and family and just kind of give thanks and, you know, um, 
talk about what you're thankful for. We've done that on the show quite a few times during the holiday season, talked about what we're thankful for and stuff like that. Um, mostly all of you is what I'm thankful for. So thank you for listening. Uh, we didn't do, <laughs> you may have, you may have noticed that last week's show was a little bit different, mainly because we had somebody on the show and it was awesome. We had Brian Gottlieb on. If you hadn't listened, which I'm pretty sure everybody that normally listens did. But uh, if you didn't, you should listen to that. And um, so the show's rails sort of fell off at points in time, and that's okay. We only had a limited amount of time with Brian, and he overstayed his commitment, which, again, thank you greatly for just even showing up, to be honest. Um, it was a good talk. I had a lot of fun. And uh, we, got, we got called out on Arsenal Pass, and they got the name of the show wrong, which was also awesome because they called us Flesh and Bad, which is a thing. Uh, Flesh and Bad is a a pot is a show or a channel, and um, I was like, "Wow, Flesh and Bad!" I really wish I would have thought of that, but but fap, I wouldn't. I think I'd rather be a, I'd rather be fapping, but regardless, the uh, the the show went a little bit off the rails, and we didn't get to all the questions we had and a lot of other things, but. It was such a good talk that I regret nothing at, at all. I just think it's funny. You think it went off the rails. I think it was the most on the rails our show has ever been, which is a, a testament to your professionalism. You were, <laughs> I think, the most buttoned up. And I'm not saying that this is um, like you you became a an actual professional here. I'm just simply saying oh, by, by your standards, right? Like. <laughs> When when the when the bar is in hell, it's easy to surpass it. And you definitely did. You were buttoned up. And so I was going to say that I was proud of you because it was the most on the rails, I think, that the show has ever been. Uh, and I do think it was in part because we knew there was the time commitment. I have a feeling that if we had an open ended commitment, like, say, Josh Scott gives us, <laughs> that it would have been a wildly different experience. Mm -hmm. Um, I certainly had a lot of things that I would have loved to have talked to Brian about, but I wanted to make sure that, you know, we covered the the stuff that the community cares about and not the stuff that I care about because <laughs> they're right, right. very rarely the same. Yeah. And I, 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 I think Brian um, will be on again. Uh, we had talked, you know, pre-recording and one of the things he had said was it's been, you know, this took way too long. I should, we should have done this a long time ago. And I had no idea he had that sentiment whatsoever but it was good to I, hear and obviously open invite for, I, uh, for Brian. yeah i i kind of did like it i i joke all the time i and i didn't get a chance to fully explain it i gave him like the cliff notes version i joke all the time and say that brian hates me but that's because i have an affinity for absurdist humor right and it's a carryover of a couple of things. One, uh, there's a lot of people that I have spoken to that I think they legitimately think Brian hates them, which cracks me up because it's always just they see him at shows. And it's like I was saying, like the man is working his tail off. And so he does his best to try to talk to people, but it's going to be short. Right. And so when you do have those interactions and if you don't have that understanding going in that it might be a bit terse, they, I think, take it the wrong way instead of just like, hey, the man's got stuff to do. So it's a combination of that. And then also uh, the the other part is whenever anything goes wrong for me, that's flesh and blood or LSS related, I always say, you know, I blame Brian and it's because he hates me. But that's also in part because, you know, again, he covered it on the show last week. People blame him. Well, I, I don't even know if blame <laughs> is the right word because, you know, he was talking about giving credit they hold as him well. Responsible and also give him credit yes, for things. They, that because he's a bit more forthright and public facing with his interaction with the community um there's a lot of people that credit him with you know whatever side of the spectrum they're on whether it's blame or credit but they they associate him with those things and so again drawn to absurdist humor i've seen some some folks say some wild things and be like yeah you know it's probably brian's fault because ever since he joined and it's not anything that's close to in the wheelhouse no. he works so again, because I think it's absurd, I start running with the like, well, you know, it's Brian's fault that blah, blah, blah. So that's that's been like my wrong, my long running thing. Well, sorry, uh, brain's going faster than my mouth. But the, the reality is, is any interaction that I've ever had with with Brian has been very earnest. He has helped me out 
when he certainly didn't need to on several occasions. Um, he's very funny. Uh, when we had our very tough episode some time ago um, regarding friend of the, the show, he reached out afterward and, and uh, honestly he gave me one of the best compliments. He said, you know, that show is going to suck no matter what, but I think you handled it as best as you could. And, you know, coming, coming from him, that meant a ton. So, um, I think, I think that we probably, you know, could have had him on sooner, but I, I do think that part of our shtick, right, was we commit to the bit and we do, we do play into sometimes being the, uh, forgotten son, the bastard son, if you will, of LSS, uh, so much. So we should, we should be flesh and snow, right? Like we, <laughs> we don't even get the stark surname we just get the snow no right? we're the, yeah we're, we're the bastards yeah um i mean that's that's somewhat fair i will go ahead i i think it's important that to note that early on we definitely earned that moniker because we were uh very much so not anywhere near um lss's era radar and we probably shouldn't have been right like we were a small show. We didn't, you know, we weren't, <laughs> we weren't exactly, and we still aren't uh, the most professional humans on the planet. I mean, fuck if I care. And it's a, it's interesting now how over time, and you know, Brian definitely spoke to our consistency, you know, that we show up every week. And at some point in time, we became at least some people in Legend Story Studios, uh, one of their favorite shows to listen to and to or to watch and that's just I, I don't know if i we got better or if it was a hold up these guys have been doing this and they kind of just like oh shit this is fun or whatever it doesn't really matter but we really can't play the lss doesn't love us card anymore it's i, I think that that's dead and gone yeah. At this point. Yeah. Like I said, uh, we, we commit to the bit and so we kept doing it, but, and I'll also say this, I can't speak for you, but I've never felt, you know, much like when I joke about like, Hey, Brian hates me. And I know that's not the case. Like I've never felt like they, they purposefully treat us like a bastard child or whatever. It's just fun to oh, do that. Right. Um, maybe, you know, we do know for a, well, I'm going to say for a fact that they are big wrestling fans over there. There's oh, just too many, oh, yeah. there's too many Easter eggs for no, it we not know to be. Are. So we, we know for a fact are. that we have some wrestling fans over there. And so to me, there is a part of me that sometimes likens it to like, we're, we're the, we're the, the outside faction, not even like the heel. Oh, we're the, okay. Yeah. We're just, um, we're not towing the line. Like, um, you know, you've got your main protagonists and your main antagonists. And then you have like, the new day off doing their own thing or something. Right. And you're we just weren't like, supposed to get over, but we did. Yeah. You know, and we're, we're yeah. the ones playing trombones and, you know, doing <laughs> silly dances and they're like, Oh, I guess. Fuck, I <laughs> like, guess. God damn it. <laughs> yeah. That makes a ton of sense. Actually, that, that analogy fits really well. <clears throat> there goes my voice. I was wondering when it was going to go. Uh, but the, the whole, you know, we get treated super well. I mean, we're even going to have uh, in short order, a couple of weeks, I think we'll have, a member, um, the head of Premier Play for LSS on. So we'll have, at that point in time, I think we've checked most of the departmental boxes, but I still want like an episode with all of the devs because I just want those guys to be on telling me how fucking stupid I am. I think that that would be a chef's kiss episode because I know I'm dumb and they are not. So uh, I would like to, I would like them to, um, force me to call them uh, daddy, mommy, master, whatever they want to be called. But uh, let's, you know, <laughs> I guess the digression part of this fucking show um, has already happened. But the reason I brought that up is because we kind of glossed over the news a bit uh, last week with Brian on. We didn't really touch on the calling Portland uh, and we really didn't go get all the way through talking about uh, the hero powers of Syndra and Fang um, as that kind of went off the rails and you started talking more about Arachne. Uh, but let's uh, let's let's dive into Portland really quick because there is stuff to talk about in that event where Michael Fong won with Enigma mm -hmm. and uh, finishing against a CYB new. And 
The top eight was the CYB new three Enigmas and two Zens. So that's six of the top eight that are Mistvale heroes still. And then an Azalea and a Dash IO who are all bounced in the quarterfinals. And so the semifinals was all Mistvale heroes. And I I noticed on the episode um, where we were uh, misnamed in Arsenal Pass that they were talking about their previous episode, which I referred to Hero Bloat. And I know that and they had brought us up because Brian had brought up the concept of Hero Bloat. Um, the top four being Mist Veil vale heroes, and this is a U.S. calling. What does that does that say anything to you that we of of note at all? I mean, yes, it definitely says something to me. Um, you know, it's funny because I I don't think that I don't think that in a vacuum this says anything about hero bloat because like you would look at this and you could go a couple of different ways, right? There's three enigmas there. So is it that there are, you know, too many heroes. And so people are, um, you know, not doing well on them because there are too many, or is it that there are too many heroes? And so, you know, the good ones overshadow the rest, blah, blah, blah. Like, like I said, in a vacuum, I think that it's very hard. Um, if I go outside of the vacuum, I tend to more agree with Brian, which is that, uh, yes, the Mistvale heroes have been incredibly strong since being released. Um, I expected more prevalence of Rosetta heroes here in this calling. Um, kind of shocked that none of them made the top eight. But specifically Aurora to me. Right. Right. But, yeah. Um, but again, it is also one event. And prior to this, we have still seen a lot of hero diversity. Mm -hmm. uh, like that's that's just the reality. And it's not even just like, you know, hey, it's a diverse top eight, but it's always, you know, the six of the same heroes in the top eight. Like we we see those what I'll call second tier. And I don't even think that's the appropriate way, but I, I just at the moment, lack a better way to articulate what I'm trying to say. But the like kind of second tier, second rung, maybe second most popular heroes, who knows how you want to, to say it. Um, but they all fight in and out of the top eights. So like we know that they are at least viable, which is good. That's where you want your game to be. Now, are there some heroes that could use some love? Absolutely. But I personally don't think that that's a hero blow issue because even when the game had like eight heroes, we had heroes who still needed some love. Like Azalea went a long time, a long time and needed love for a long time. Right. And she's not the only one. And so I think people even now, you know, you can point at, you know, Riptides or Betsy's or whatever. And some of them are just the heroes. And the, the reality is, even though it sucks because people identify with their heroes, um, people have a favorite and they they want to play them. Um, not every hero is is going to, one, always be good, but even even some might take a long time to be good because some heroes, heroes are a card like anything else. So some of them are going to be overtuned and some of them are going to be undertuned. And if you have an undertuned hero, and by that I mean like literally the, the text on a hero... It's going to take a while. How about this one? Uh, so I, I, I actually think that he is fine and just needs a different meta to succeed. I think uh, Jarl is interesting because I think that Enigma being as strong as she is right now, and I was going to get to that at the end of this rant, um, I, I think that that's really detrimental to, to Jarl being at all reasonably viable. But uh, to finish the hero bloat, train of thought that I was on. I just think that if your hero comes out of the box, if you will, undertuned, it takes that much more effort to make them viable at some point. Right. And that that's also OK, because, again, it's like Brian said, like you're not going to have a, a perfect card game ever. Right. You're going to have hits and misses. You're going to have some things that don't work out the way that you want. It's all. um it's all very hard to do. You know, I always say this, but like card game players, uh, they tend to forget, I think, how hard card games are to make oh, right. 
to make successful, to to do all of these things. So um, I don't personally think we're at a spot where Hero Bloat is an issue yet. Again, there's always room for improvement, but I don't think that it's super problematic. Uh, now, that being said, uh, the other thing that says to me is I look at this and I say, hey, um, you know, 75% of this is all Misfail heroes. And mm -hmm. Misfail heroes were good when Misfail dropped. Um, they kind of took a, I'm not going to say a backseat, but like um, a more reasonable share of the pie post Rosetta release for a bit. But I'm a little concerned that no Rosetta heroes are here and we're back to Misfail dominance because. Uh, you know, like I was saying, some heroes come out undertuned and some come out overtuned. And I think there's an argument to be made that the heroes themselves, not even just like their suite of cards, but just like the text on them might be overtuned. Um, I don't think it was done on purpose necessarily, but I do think that when you think about how convoluted the transcend mechanic is and i love it and i don't i don't say convoluted as a as a bad thing i just mean comparatively to other flesh and blood mechanics you have these cards that um you know you have to play other cards before you activate them they're instants which you know up until that point in miss veil weren't necessarily a a centered thing uh, around anything mm -hmm. that weren't wizards um it's a no block card and then it also flips to a resource and it's you know the first flip card that goes back into your deck and there you know, I mean, it's the first time we ever had anything where there was reminders about like D G and all of that. Right. Like it is a convoluted mechanic. And so I think if I had to guess. Right. And, and this is my amateur dev. I don't have nearly the experience actual devs have. But if I had to guess, it feels like they said, OK. If this is going to be hard to pull off, there needs to be a big payoff. And so I think that the payoff being on the hero cards um, is where we're running into a problem, because that means you always have access to them and they're always you know, pretty strong. Um, and even in the case of new, if they're not there, then she has mask as like a fallback. Right. Uh, right. Well, pretty but good also it just turns out that it's not that hard to do it. And right. I think ultimately that's it. And I, I think that they didn't want it to be hard, but I do think that at some point in the design stage, they probably said, Hey, like this feels like it could be hard. There should be a payoff here. And I just feel like maybe the payoff was a bit overtuned. Um, and again, I, I think that that is on the hero card in these particular instances. And so I think that we should expect to see a lot more of them for a bit, um, as much as that, you know, it pains me to say it uh, strictly because. And so this is the last thing I want to take away. I'm not surprised that we have three enigmas. Um, I think Enigma is incredibly strong right now. I think she has been strong. I think that her slow performance in the early parts of Misfail were entirely caused by two different things. Uh, the first was unoptimized lists. The second was Zen was incredibly powerful and much easier to pilot at the time. And those two things meant Zen got all of the shine. But now that Zen is a bit more in check, um, now that people have more optimized lists, now that You've got more reps on it. Um, Enigma is a force. I was scared of her then. Um, it, it was a, a problem when I was doing all of my testing around like nationals time. I'm still scared of her now. She just does a lot of things very well. And there's another thing that I know about, you know, we make the illusionist joke a lot on this show, but the diehard illusionist players in flesh and blood are also typically some of the better players in the game because they have to understand all of the phases, all of the steps, etc. And so if they're all on Enigma right now, you know, like Michael Feng, uh, you got to look out because it's just a good it's a good deck. It's a good hero. And I know that there's a lot of people who misunderstand it because the number of times I've been watching a broadcast and people say like, oh, well, the, you know, the Enigma is going to fatigue and they don't understand that, like, you're going to get to where you just double chi, like once mm -hmm. on their turn, once on your turn, and you're always swinging. But they somehow think without some sort of external banish, you know, I, I have actually fatigued an Enigma on Arachne because you can banish you can those banish things. The, you can banish their chi. Right. Yeah. But otherwise, you're just not going to do it. But I've seen people say like, oh, the game is over. The Enigma is fatigued. And I'm like, you do not understand Enigma then because this is this is their this is playground. Checkmate. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, uh, my my short cliff notes answer. If you're you know, if you've been listening to me drone on, but only not like 
somewhat paying attention because I don't know, that was really long winded and I wouldn't want to listen to me. Um, <laughs> I think hero bloat's not really that much of an issue right now. Uh, I think the misfailed heroes are all um, just a bit above par because of literally the text on the heroes themselves. And I think Enigma is a monster, has always been a monster, and we're just now like getting to the part where people are finding it out. Yeah, there's a, a couple of things in there. And one of them is I think Enigma became harder when Enigma splintered off into two separate viable good lists. Because you have 10K and you have the more controlly, sometimes play CYB Enigma. And both of those being viable when you sit, especially early in tournaments, when you sit down, you don't necessarily know which one it is. And the game plan into them are, is different. Now, you can know within a few turns and then pivot if need be and usually be okay. But sometimes the inefficiencies of your deck because of what you plan for will kill you. And the other portion is, you know, to go along with what you were saying about Enigma and Endgame, just go watch the Rob Catton versus Gregor Kowalski uh, quarterfinal match from Worlds. It'll tell you everything you need to know. I mean, it's Aurora versus Enigma. And read chat. While you're watching the match, have chat up. Because chat will just over and over talk about how, you know, Rob's got this game in the bag, blah, 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 blah. Enigma's going to run out of cards. And I, and you'll find us, like you'll find our channel name saying, no, Enigma's actually got this. This, I don't think Aurora that Rob can actually win. You're crazy. Well, turns out that when you understand the concept of a having two spectral shields, you know, one on their turn, one on your turn, and always attacking for two when you're going to get them to the point that they can only attack for one. And then that one is soaked up by one of the spectral shields. You that's checkmate. The game ends. And you'll notice that Rob concedes with 30 life, I think. And because he knows he's dead. Mm -hmm. He knows there's no winning. And that's like, that's it. And well, and also the game had gone on for almost 90 minutes at that point. But that's the thing, right? And that's what makes Enigma so scary is they always have their end game in sight. They know what they're working towards. And it's and the 10K decks are there. They're, they're just going to blast you, you know, with three attacks in reality. And if they the old saying, if they attack with the uh, manifestations of Mirage twice, game's over. And that's pretty close to true, turns out that. Attack for eight, attack for eight is usually enough. And uh, the good players, I, I know uh, I've had this discussion with a few different people at this point in time, but they always talk about how you'll know a good Enigma player by when they when they traverse. Because a good Enigma player knows that you traverse not to play the manifestations, but to protect the manifestations. Like, you have time. Just use it. And against some decks, you might not. Like, you, there are aggro decks that do just run through Enigma. That's why I was a little shocked there was no Auroras in Portland's top eight. Because most of the time, Aurora can go through Enigma. And that's... So I was a little bit surprised there. And maybe Enigma's lists have just tightened up enough that that's not going to be the case going forward. But... um. That you know, the two Zens that are there too, like again, go wide, really hard to block out. Um, their game plan doesn't necessarily spend all their cards in weird successions. They have the ability, like they have the ability to have unpreventable damage with Shuko. I mean, it's just usually checks all the boxes against an illusionist, but didn't work out that way. Um, so I thought that, that was interesting too. Uh, anything else from uh, Calling Portland you want to talk on? Because now we have Battle Hard in Geneva. Um, no, I think that pretty much covers it. I mean, we kind of talked a bit more last week as well because we were all watching it live at the same right, time. Right. So that's part of it. So I think, uh, I think we can... You can move forward. And I also think that it is important because I was saying that like in a vacuum, it's hard to say that that says anything. And this Battle Hard in Geneva in my opinion, further reinforces what I was saying that like 
other instances recently don't to me say like hero bloat because we've had pretty diverse top eights and so we should move on to uh battle heart in geneva because that's gonna make me sound smart yep yep <laughs> and that's that's actually true um so then we go to battle heart in geneva so again back to classic constructed this one's one was won by uh and i hope i do not butcher this name but i probably will enki dupaquia on uh viscerai and the finals match was Viscerai, it was uh, Enki on Viscerai versus Simon Nielsen, Simon Nielsen on Zen. And it was a very <laughs> super close match. And Enki found a, a a line to go to one and be able to present enough arcane plus damage that if Simon drew like a single no block, the game was over. So uh, that was it was very well piloted. So I do encourage you. It is on YouTube. So there was coverage on this one. Um, it is in French, but uh, regardless, it's still pretty easy to to watch the matches um, and get what's going on. But very well covered. And the top eight is interesting because we're back to diversity. Uh, we only had one hero that was represented as a, as more than one, and that was Aurora. So Aurora's back as a two of in this top eight. And then you have Jarl. Uh, the Zen and the Viscerai that we talked about already, Enigma, New, and Levaya. Now, no Dash IOs, no Azaleas. Those feel like they're the they're they're in the interloper tier of decks now, where they'll show up every now and again as a one of, but you'll you won't see two Azaleas or two Dash IOs normally in a top eight. That's just not part of the plan. You will see two Zens. You will see two Enigmas. You will see two Auroras. You will see sometimes see two News. Leviathan is completely out of left field for me. And but Call to the Grave is very good. And then we don't. I mean, to me, I don't know what to think about Yarl. But if you if you were expecting a lot of go wide aggressive decks, you don't. Yarl doesn't have to be well tuned necessarily to stymie those decks. No. So um, the fact that there is a Zen of Viscerai and two Auroras sitting in the top eight of this event makes me think that Jarl was was eaten well in spots. And well, so what's your take here? How do you feel about, about this top eight in comparison? This is more of what I would expect. Um, in fact, so... The one Enigma jumps out to me because, again, I, I think she's incredibly strong right now. So if I was going to see anything in multiples, I would traditionally expect that. But when I'm looking at the rest of this top eight, it's like Enigma and Jarl and then um, stuff that can be aggressive. Uh, new is in an interesting spot because, uh, again, it's very much how you build her, right? You can go right. CYB new. You can go mid range new. You can go in a very aggressive new. Um, so that that one kind of depends. But when I see a, a top eight that's got a Viscerai, a Zen, two Auroras, a, a Levaya, I'm like, all right, it makes sense to me that Enigmas are a little less represented because either they're just less popular there or the aggressive field was just too much to get right all of the time, um, which, again, does, I think kind of to me anyway explain why the Earl was there I'm not surprised that the Earl didn't win it though because you can do well enough into those fields but again it's still pretty early and kind of untuned so trying to figure out the the right answers um, and it's also just not as straightforward as it has been in other metas there's a lot of metas that have existed where if you play a guardian um, your disruption cards were good against everybody and Yarl has some of those, like Channel Lake Frigid is just universally good, for example. But if you play like a Spinal Crush, for example, it's really good against Zen and Aurora here, potentially. But Aurora could also give uh, action points with Blink if they're running those in their list. Uh, and then I look at somebody like Viscerai, where they, you know, can just take a turn off if needed. Um it's not like a huge deal breaker. So not everything I think is locked in for Yarl yet. And that was some of what I was talking about, I don't know, two or three weeks ago when you and I were, were saying um, 
you know, why does it feel like Yarl's missing something? And like, yes, we have the mangle and we can give the mangle dominate, but your other stuff still doesn't have dominate. Um, unless you are playing, you know, Terra Sunder or, you know, something that's just inherently giving it dominate, but your spinal crushes don't have dominate naturally. So you got to either find a way to do it. Maybe that's like with Polar Blast or whatever. Right. But then they could just pay for it. Um, it's, you have more hoops. It's just, oh, it's just far. not as easy. So that makes sense to me again ultimately like one in the top eight not a surprise especially seeing how many other aggressive decks are there in the top eight but uh, i also would not have been shocked if we saw zero yarls because it's so early in his his lifespan yeah and again yarls not tuned i know that a lot of people you included actually have been kind of scrambling and and looking for a looking for a yarl deck looking for a yarl list and I think the consensus right now is there's no consensus. Like, it's just hard because I think right now, um, I think right now most people are like me, and you really want to run a hundred cards, and you right. only have room for eighty. And getting it whittled down is going to be very difficult because the reality is, um. You know, you're a guardian, you want to be defensive. This is one that very clearly benefits from playing some level of defensiveness, whether it's his specializations or the frostbite effects or the fact that his weapon costs six to swing. So uh, you you know that you're going to be playing defense, but also you have to have a way to win the game, right? So getting the the offense that you want in there and having it be the right offense and having it work is also very difficult and so i i think two months from now we'll probably have some really solid lists but yep right now it, it's not it's not a thing um, at this point in time but it's it's good to see that you know again week one heroes they just they always find their way in in this case, Jarl, uh, legal as of um, this recording two days ago. Uh, top eight's the first battle harden that it's eligible for. Sure. Every damn time. Uh, let's move on. Let's, uh, let's round back to the hunted. Uh, we didn't talk. We did talk a lot about the hunted with Brian. Uh, what we didn't get to was talking through... Um, the heroes in depth that we now know the text of. So let's round back to Syndra really quick because we talked about Syndra, but we didn't spend a, a ton of time with Syndra. And to remind people at home, uh, Syndra's hero text is, I mean, they're all 440 heroes. Uh, whenever you hit a marked, create a, uh, marked hero, create a, f a fealty token. And those are the, uh, you can break them to make attacks draconic. Uh, once per turn instant, it's three red pips. Equip up to two draconic draconic daggers from your graveyard. This costs one uh, one resource less to activate for each draconic link you control. Okay, so my comment to Brian was, so this is just free, right? And he's like, yeah, it's that's it's pretty much just free. Okay, good to know. No, that might be what your your brain registered. That's not what he actually said. He was very coy about it. He he what he said was uh some something incredibly non-committal. Like I was paying very close attention. <laughs> A lot of those times when we would say things that were speculative, it was I don't know, something along the lines of like, you know, could be or, you know, we'll see or if that's what you think, right? Like he was very non-committal, um, the sly dog. So I, yeah. But At least I, we know we're I, getting draconic da draconic daggers, though. I mean, yeah, pretty much already knew. But, um, I guess you're right. Like going to thinking back on it, yeah, that is closer to what he said. But the vibe I got was definitely, yeah, pretty much, um. So a lot of people are trying to load up on flick knives and conceal blades and um, hurls and stuff like that to to try to um, to try to eat daggers at higher clips. Don't blame them. 
I mean, it looks like it's a core part of the Dr- Draconic Ninja's um, play style this time around. And there's lots of, uh, and I noticed in our Discord, there's a lot of Mask of Momentum talk and how it works with thrown daggers. So I can't wait to bury Josh Scott in Mask of Momentum questions. It's going to be so much fun. But uh, anything else that you wanted to talk through on Syndra? No, I think that pretty much covers it. I mean, we did last week as well talk about a lot of the speculative stuff, which is where I seem to have the most fun because I see things and I say like, all right, you know, how does it work? What does it mean? Um, I'm... I'm very curious. So a lot of people are, you know, you were talking about like Concealed Blade and and whatever. Um, Concealed Blade is interesting because you equip from your inventory. And so I am also interested myself in how a card like Concealed Blade will pair with Syndra. Um, potentially. Because yeah. one of the things that I used to like, I, when Concealed Blade first came out, uh, it was one of the cards I messed around with a lot it's actually it's one of my favorite majestics that just doesn't see play and the reason that i liked it is because it gives you the potential to modify your game plan so one of the things i was trying to make work uh as an assassin player for a long time was like starting with say spider's bite and scale peeler right and you use scale peeler to annoy them until eventually they just have to give up their equipment but then once the equipment stuff is gone I would use that as like a flick knives and then hopefully the idea was concealed blade in your nerf scalpels or something like that where you can continuing to get that value. Um, So I like the idea of like running different daggers. Uh, I'm, I'm interested to see whether or not we get multiple draconic draggers. Uh, (laughs) Yeah. I am same as me right now. Like I can't, I can't speak either. Well, here's the thing, man. Like I am, completely sober i am just i think tired yeah which is weird because i also haven't done anything (laughs) um that might be why it's exhausting resting have you ever noticed that like resting is actually exhausting it kind of is um multiple times during this break i woke up and i was like i feel more tired now and i don't know if it's because i actually got good rest for the first time and i don't know how to handle it or what right um but anyway yeah my point was uh, I'm curious whether or not we're just going to get one set or if we'll have, you know, different ones. I mean, obviously, I expect some some token ones that are are going to be usable. I just didn't know because both uh, Syndra and Fang uh, appear to be anyway uh, focused on daggers, but one being a, a ninja, one being a warrior. I didn't know if we were going to maybe get two sets like that are maybe geared one for one class, one for the other, but there could be use cases where you would want to swap them out or, or whatever. Um, That's what I'm kind of keeping an eye on, right? Is, is Mm -hmm. there, is there any reason that you would want to run something like concealed blade to do swapsies? Potentially. And I, you can also just put more daggers in inventory. I feel like, Fang and Syndra's daggers will be the same. I don't think there'll be warrior ones and ninja ones. I think it'll just be effectively a generic, but it'll be draconic. Yeah. So draconic dagger. I just didn't know if, um, it's also possible they just don't tie, I guess, uh, the daggers to either one of them. But the thing that was giving me pause was the idea of like signature weapons in Living Legend, right? Because if if it's one set of daggers that's meant for both of them, mm-hmm. you don't want to hose one hero, right? Because the other one, Living Legend or vice versa. So that's why I, I didn't know if we would get other ones um, or if maybe there's like, maybe there is a token version, but then they each have like one rare one. Um, right. It could be like in the rare slot so that it's draftable because I'm thinking about things like hot streak that were in heavy hitters or whatever. We might have like two daggers in the rare slot. So there might be one generic token one and then like one that Cinder likes and one that Fang likes or something. And the, the reason I was thinking about stuff like that is because with all of the warrior stuff, like making your your next attack do more and whatever, you could have a dagger theoretically that says like, you know, if this is buffed, it also gets plus one or whatever. So that's more appealing to the warrior class. 
Um, whereas ninja thing could be like a chain link thing. Like if this is, you know, draconic, right? Like if this is a draconic chain link, you know, four or higher, right? Then yeah, it gets bigger or whatever. Yeah. What's the, um, cause it could, could be a chain ender if you don't always have it. What's the lava uh, burst. Yeah. But what's the mechanic called? That's a keyword. Um, it is lava burst. What I was thinking of, but I, shit dude i'm uh, so mad at myself that i, I can't think of it also, right now i am also kind of angry with myself right now so because i'm gonna look it up and i'm gonna just be like motherfucker ah uh, you want to know it or you want to get you want it a minute just give it to me because i like my it's rupture rupture okay i kept thinking that it was an r but then my my brain I, kept I, I, wanting I kept to thinking go to explosion B. And yeah like i, I uh, yeah, well, I sure. kept thinking I kept thinking B, I think because of burst, burst I always associate right. it with lava burst, but it's not the only card that has it. But I, I was just thinking to myself, like, again, if you have like one token weapon, right, you could have one rare dagger that, like I said, is like for warriors. And then you could have one for like Cinder that's like rupture gets plus one. And yep. so even in like a limited format, you get some payoff for going wide and you get the one dagger that points, a, you know, pokes a little harder or whatever. Well, let's go to Fang really quick. Uh, Fang Drakaya Blades. Um, same thing, 440 Royal Draconic Warrior. Uh, whenever you hit a marked hero, again, back to marking, create a fealty token. If you control three or more fealty tokens, because they do stack up, as long as you played a draconic um, or created a, a draconic attack or uh, have created a fealty token that turn, they stick around, otherwise they go away. Um, but if you control th control three or more fe uh, fealty tokens, dagger attacks you cost uh, cost you one resource less to activate. Um, so that could actually feed into the logic of different daggers for the classes too, because I don't think you want dagger kadachis. Although, or, you know, the I mean, you could I guess want uh, draconic kadachis. I don't know. Yeah, well, I, I was wondering if we were going to get something that was literally like if you've pitched a draconic card. Right. Or it could be if you pitched a red, it gets that's, go again. That's the other one is reds was was the thing I was thinking of. But and then that would actually if if it's reds in particular, that would make Fang's uh, hero tech significant because that's like giving you two extra cards potentially right. per turn, assuming that the, the daggers have go again. Right. Um which is interesting because like proclamation of vengeance becomes playable. It's otherwise it's kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Cause Mark isn't it's Mark is kind of not. It, it, you are marked until an opponent hits you like that's marked like the entire ability. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's that whole, like the, the ability of marked is that you're marked. There's nothing yeah. else to it. It's the opposite of stealth, right? It's stealth that I give to my opponent. Yeah. Stealth much. is nothing until you do something that cares about stealth and marked is just marked until you do something that cares about marked. Right. I'm looking forward to like custom tokens, right? So like I want to have a stack of marked tokens. And so when I mark somebody, they'll get like my Mark Wahlberg or my Mark Ruffalo or you know, just a series of marks, and I'm like, you're Mark you know, McGuire. Yeah, you get it. Uh, I, I, I do. You've been marked. <sighs> I hate everything. Like, I don't. Oh. See, that, you know what? I, my, do you want to know why my my brain is probably fried? I think it's been, you know, too too many leftovers, and I feel like I should just quit. But it it's really hard to stop cold turkey. Motherfucker. I knew <laughs> that that bullshit was coming. And I just let you do it. I didn't even stand in the way at all. I just yeah. said, you know what? I'm going to let him have his dumb fucking cold turkey joke because I know it'll make him feel better. And I know he doesn't want to. So the only reason I'm letting you have it is because you don't want it. That's why. Yeah, that's legit. Also, fuck you. Because that was... There's a lot of good marks, though. There's a lot like, of good marks. That's what I'm saying. That's actually kind of a funny uh, thing Slap to somebody do. with a Marky Ramon. Uh, hit him with a Mark Twain. 
Uh, Dude, a Mark Twain would be so know, good. Right? To smack him with a Mark Twain. It's got to it's got to say like marked, and it's got to have the picture of the person, and then we need to have a, a quote of theirs, like where the text would be. So and like Twain quotes are, are yeah, they go hard. They go hard. Um, Marky Mark, I don't know what you want him for. for what, what movie you want a Mark Wahlberg quote from? But it's going to be out there. Um, yeah, honestly, it's probably um, God. What was the buddy comedy he did with Will Ferrell? Uh, the other guys is that the it? other guys. Yeah. Cause for me, like the only thing that he's ever done that consistently, like I care about at all is when you got him in the, the office and he goes, come on, I'm a peacock. You gotta let me fly. <laughs> like that just gets me That's, every time. That one's pretty good. Yeah. So if you were, if you accidentally stacked them, we would, would you give people Richard marks? Um, no, I would give them Carl marks. Oh, now we're doing it. Yeah. Um, you could uh, just give them the, you know, the communist manifesto. Just here. You're marked. You have marks. Um, we could go deep on this. We could come up with a lot of really good ones. Um, like, how many people are going to get the Mark Knopfler? Probably not enough. People should obviously get that one. But... Um, yeah, we'll have to, we'll have to brainstorm more marks because there's some pretty, oh no, the, the room. Oh, hi, Mark. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Oh, hi, Mark. (laughs) Oh, hi, Mark. (laughs) Uh. That one's, that one's game. Like that one's perfect. And then for the other token, I'm just going to take some tea leaves and then staple it to a generic card so that they can feel tea. (laughs) That one's really bad. I know. The badder, the better in my mind. That one's really bad. (sighs) Okay, spill some tea. Go. Um, All right, 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 right. we're going to move on. But that's fun. Uh, The new gem dashboard is out there. If you have not gone and looked at your gem profile lately, and you probably should, um, it has changed. It looks way different, but it looks way better. Um, much easier to navigate, in my opinion. Um, it's a really good hub now. I feel like it's less uh, less Windows 98. But, um, and I think in this case, that's a good thing. That's not always a good thing, by the way. Sometimes people make things less Windows 98 and they accidentally make it GeoCities, which is <laughs> worse. Uh, this is this is not that. This actually looks really good. Um, so kudos to the team that worked on that and got that up up and running. Uh, I have exactly, I have, I have exactly two thousand experience flat. That's how many. Ex- that's my experience is two k. I kind of don't want to play in events, so it's always two k. My but, experience is traumatic. Well, okay. Beyond that, what's your XP in relation to flesh and blood? Um, I would have to go look, but it's not nearly as impressive as yours. I mean, I don't know. It's if that's probably impressive. half because um, I I've been losing out on armory experience for like a year now. So that's true. Yeah, but mine is. I think my rated wins is probably one of my worst stats. But yep. So lifetime XP is two k. My rated wins, um, is one hundred and thirteen. So not a ton of rated wins, but eh. um, it's still nice. It could be at 2K experience. Apparently that's a decent number. It's I'm 296 in the US, if that means anything. Um, I really wish this zero PTI didn't say zero, though. I wish it had a number on it. But alas, it does not. Uh, did any other, did you go look at your dashboard? No, you should. Well, it looks well, nice. Oh, I mean, I've, I've seen my dashboard. Sorry. I, okay. I thought you meant right now. No, not right now, but I, no, okay. I went and saw it. Um, a buddy of mine sent me something I had to fill out. And so I was like, oh yeah, let me look at my gem number. Oh, this is really pretty. And then I started poking around. Well, that's good. I'm going to guess that buddy is me. No, um, I, I, I said a buddy. Not a brother. Oh, okay. but yes, well, that was, it was also you. But it was also me. Yeah, great. Um, 
all right, I ate shit last week. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck off. Like, that is true. I ate shit last week uh, because I had not post posed this question to you. And a uh, couple of different reasons uh, that I hadn't yet, mainly because um, I kind of had felt like I had time to fit this into an episode where there wasn't a whole lot to talk about because I've gone about this, you know, on about this quite a bit at this point, because I've talked about it with uh, Stephen Cookus and Doa and now Brian. So it's and I've gone into my piece of this quite a bit as well. But now we're going to ask you, we're going to let you answer this and see how big of a smart ass you want to be or if this is something that you actually want to talk about. Um, I I just want you to know that when you say like I thought I had time, the first thing that I thought was like you think far more about my well being than I do. This is actually facts. Like I do think about your well well being. Because I was like, way man, more time, you do. time. You never know what's going to happen, man. You're right. I don't. I, you don't. And um, the. Uh, if you're hearing an alarm in the background, it's because my wife is making uh, leek and potato soup and it's wafting through the vents. It actually smells quite good. But um, I do think about your well-being a lot because I want I want you to outlive me. That's really the whole thing. But um, so I'm going to pose the question and again, answer it however you see fit. But the the real the crux of it is why trading card games and why flesh and blood. Um. Well, so the 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 why flesh and blood. I think I've talked about quite a bit on this. Um, it scratches an itch that no other card game on the market does whatsoever because it's degenerative design. It is character focused. Um, I think a lot of people just really enjoy character focused things and you see it even just outside of card games, uh, something that is very, very popular in a lot of gaming media, right? So uh, I'm a firm believer that games like, um, you know, Dota League of Legends, for example, are in part as popular as they are because they have characters that people can main, right? Um, that's why we even use the term over here because it was a term that was already coined in other games. Same thing with fighting games, right? And this is also very much modeled after a fighting game. Mm-hmm. You pick a character that you're really good at. You know, for me, it's Melina, for example. I main Melina when I play Mortal Kombat. Okay. So when you factor in like it's degenerative design... Um, the resource system creates a tension that I absolutely adore. I think that card games, um, card games are interesting to me. And I think that they also allow people to showcase skill the most when you present a series of micro decisions. Um, I'm, I'm going to mention something that probably not a lot of people who are listening know a ton about, or definitely not as much as say I know, um, When I was covering the game Artifact, yes, that game that lasted for like two months or whatever. um, But when I was covering it, I'm one of the few people on the planet that I think legitimately liked the game. And there were a lot of people who had complaints about the gameplay because uh, at the start of each turn, your like extra minions that were on the board would generate arrows and that just determined which way they were attacking right they could either be left right or straight and that was done randomly but it was one of those things where if you were a good player you could hedge your bets or play around potential bad outcomes um if you were somebody who just said hey rng is rng and like whatever then you were going to lose a lot and then you would just blame it on rng and you would reinforce your your bad thoughts Um, But the reason that I mentioned that game is because um, as weird as it sounds, having a bunch of these what seemed like coin flips was actually really important for determining the skill in that game. And on the back end, you know, and I had, you know, access to developers and, you know, I, I, I could have these conversations. 
um, they could tell you that like the people that were good at that game were astronomically better than like your average player. Like there was a massive separation. It was not Pokemon where coin flips are coin flips. Uh, this was something radically different. And it all came down to um, the good players could manage all of those micro decisions that were created by each individual bit of variance. And so with card games in particular, one of the things that appeals to me is that you have to have some level of variance. Um, and I'll I'll talk a bit about, well, I'll just say it now because it's also part of the question, right? So one of the reasons that I am drawn to card games is because of variance. Uh, as much as we all complain about it, as much as it all drives us all nuts, the, the variance is important because it means I can play the same game and not have the same outcome a ton of times in a row, right? It creates a unique experience that is still a familiar experience, and that's due to variance. And I like games where you're presented with this new scenario and you are rewarded for making the right decision, right? And where people have problems with variance is not when variance exists, but when the weight of the outcome is unfavorable, right? So like nobody wants to just sit around and flip a coin, right? That's not fun. Mm -hmm. Um some, I mean, sure, some people do, but like if that's the entire game, right? And it's literally just win or lose based on whether you call it, um, that's not as fun. But if instead there are, you know, over the course of a game, the equivalent of like 30 different coin flips, but then you can now give yourself advantage or disadvantage for, you know, doing right things and so forth. And not one coin flip decides the entire game, but now it's all of these micro decisions that are made throughout that's to me far more engaging, right? So I I really like games that have variance and even potentially have a high amount of variance, but the outcome or the result of the variance is low so that you can continue to kind of get inches and and fight, you know, for for uh for my football fans out there, you know, the the old like um football is a game of inches is exactly what I think of when I think of card games, right? Like I I like card games where it feels like my card game is a game of inches and flesh and blood is definitely that when you're playing against good players and they understand that like getting, you know, value out of three blocks or when, when it's time to take less value because you want to stop an on hit effect and the on hit is more important than more damage later. All of those things are what makes the game interesting and dynamic to me. So that's why flesh and blood it's, it's character centric. It's uh, got degenerative instead of progressive design um, but also it just feels like there is tension throughout the entire game, whether it's because of the four card hand or the way that all the cards can be used for many different things. And so figuring out the proper way to utilize it, I just I just adore it for that. Um, the why card games is uh, a little bit different. Um, I would say at its core, it's probably because like that's um, one, it's how I learned how to count. Uh, and two, it, it was some of the, the best memories of family that I do have. So when I was very young um, and my, my parents would work, I would stay with my, my grandmother, Grandma Oswald. And she taught me how to count uh, from, you know, zero to ten by letting me be her scorekeeper while she played Euchre with friends. Yep. And then from there, once I got to that, then she would play just like at home single deck blackjack with me to get me to count to 21. And then from there, it was like she taught me how to play, you know, poker because then I had to count like my pennies and my nickels and we would, you know, play, you know, dime poker at home. Um, but that literally like I learned math because of my grandma just playing cards with me. Um, so I've always had an affinity for just cards because, like I said, some of my my best memories I have of just family in general because the rest of my family is. Something. Um, so. When I was nine, um, I started my first my first introduction to trading card games was actually Marvel Overpower because Terrible I was uh, reading Marvel comics, um, liked the characters, saw a card game. Hey, uh, this was also at around uh, the time. So just a couple of years before was when they had the like Marvel trading cards for the people who remember those. 
Um, so like I, it was, it was a natural evolution, right? Like I was already trying to collect, you know, the full Marvel the s- masterpieces set. Okay. The masterpieces set. Okay. Cause yeah. like, that's where you're in the flare ones. Yep. Yeah. 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 Cause those the masterpiece ones they were awesome. so good. So good. Um, so then I was like, Oh, there's a game I can play. Like I like card games. I like Marvel stuff. I've been collecting them. So I started playing Marvel overpower. Um, obviously the game wasn't good. Um, so, but I, my, now my interest was like peaked, right? So I wanted to do something. So then I went up and then, you know, the next step is like, Hey, dragons are cool. I like, you know, magic and sword and sorcery. And so like many people did, I started playing magic. So oh, I, oh. Uh, so, uh, no, I actually did play a little bit of, uh, Wyvern. Wyvern is if, fine. Uh, if, if <laughs> you want to know, but, um, so magic was the one that like clicked next. So I started playing that in 1994, um, and then it just be kind of came the thing that um, was my escape, really. So I I grew up incredibly poor. Um, I was homeless at times. I moved uh, from actual residences 16 times before I graduated high school. Uh, some of that does not count, like also staying um, with family members or whatever. Um, home, like. It's so weird, right? Because when you're going through it, it, you know, and this is something that I, you know, I've I've talked about um, with some of the therapists that I've destroyed and whatever. But like <laughs> when I think Christ. back, uh, when I think back, I'm like, you know, it, you know, like, yeah, my mom it, it was was fine. Like, and, you know, my my biological father, like we got along and like it wasn't a, an issue. But then like when I describe things to people who had other experiences they're like oh man i'm so sorry right and it's so weird to me like when people say that because like when you're going through it and that's the only thing you know especially as a child you're just like ah it's just that's just the way life is but um you know at the time i didn't really understand it but i did uh very clearly not like it at home because i always found whatever excuse i could to go somewhere else um i stayed the night at friends houses a lot um when i'd got home from you know school or whatever i would always find some place to go and so for a bit one of the places um that i started going to was a local comic and gaming shop Uh, at the time it was called daggett's comics um i would later work for them and then for the new owner when it was changed over to comic utopia much later uh in part because i spent all my time there like i literally i would just go up and that was my escape and so, yeah, it was it was magic. And then it became literally every card game under the sun. That's why I've played so many card games, because I spent all my time there to not be at a place with like literal neo-Nazis and drug addicts and and whatever that was in my household at the time. Right. But again, like, you know, if you would have asked me then and even now, I'd be like, oh, yeah, like, you know, my mom did her best and she loves me and whatever. Well, loved me. She's passed. Um but, you know, when I think back, I'm like, no, that was that was awful, right? <laughs> like, mm-hmm. um, but so that was my escape. It was literally, it was comics and it was card games. Um, and then I met, because I spent so much time up there, uh, thankfully, um, some older adults who worked at the store kind of like took me in because I think they knew. Um, so they, they would, eventually they started inviting me over to other functions. Like I'd go over to Keith's house. He was the owner for like wrestling pay-per-views and be like him and some of the other guys that worked there. Um, When I turned 18, they were the ones that did something like real. I I put air quotes on it, Um, but real for my birthday. Like they took me to the casino, um, which I always laugh about because like one of the guys that worked there, his name was Scott. He was like 27 at the time. And when we got there, they carded him, but not me. And I was like so excited to get carded at the casino and then they didn't care. Um, So but yeah, I just I spent all my time there. Um, The person who I would eventually call my best friend. So his name was uh, Rob. Uh, he worked there and I, I would spend a lot of time at his house. Like we even went uh, like on a vacation together when I was like 14. Again, like looking back, my parents shouldn't have been like, why is some like guy trying to take you on a vacation? But like we went up to the UP for a weekend and it was whatever. Um, and he, he was great. Um, he has also passed. He took his own life uh, when I was 23. Um, that, that one is also very mixed for me because it was like, I, I got, I had just got a job that I'd wanted really badly. And so I took the phone call that I got the job. And the, so it was back during the landline days. So like I hang up the phone and then I, I, I hit like the, the thing to the dial tone so I can start calling Rob. Like at that moment, I was going to call him next to tell him. And when I hit it, instead of hearing a dial tone, I hear a woman saying hello. 
And I'm like, hello. Apparently, you know, I picked it up at the same time. Um, and ended up being his sister, and she was calling to tell me that uh, he had committed suicide. So, um, yeah, uh, card games are usually my escape. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so that's why. Um, and it's just to talk, you know, you you talk about community and how it was fitting in for you. For me, it's definitely that. Um, it was a it was an escape, but it was also, you know, I I look back and I I owe so much of me being a semi-functional human being to not just community, but like literally to the adult in the space who, you know, they could have just seen me as a customer. They could have seen me as an annoying kid. They could have whatever. And they didn't, they, they let me show up. They, you know, they, they treated me as an equal as opposed to whatever. Um, so, you know, the, the Keith's and, and Jerry's and, you know, Rob and Scott and, you know, Brandy and Carl and all, all, all of those people, like, I just, I don't, I don't know where I'd be without like comics and card games, like just legitimately, because it gave me something that I could fall into. Yeah, it's, um, I guess I odds the wrong word, but I think that having an escape is vitally important for anyone. Um, Cause I don't, you know, it, your life might be wonderful. It might be the, it might be awesome. You may have, you know, a fantastic wife um, and, you, you know, great kids and you grew up in a stable household and, you know, you have a good job. Um, you don't really have any worries in the, in the world. You still need something that is you and that allows you to sort of, you know, take the, take the filter off a little bit, you know, take the gloves off a little bit, change out of the dad, you know, vest and, and put on, you know, put on the leathers. Let's go fucking, you know, do a biker bar, whatever, you know, whatever that is, or in your case, it'd be like a cyclist bar, I'm sure, because you are lame as shit. But the no dude the, like i had a family full of neo-nazis of course we had bikers well those aren't the good bikers but oh, i didn't say that <laughs> right but the the big the big takeaway i think and and something that i really you know i talk about in my life a lot you know when i'm not on the show even is it personal identity is such an important thing and Wherever you find that community that, you know, embraces you, who you are, it really, it takes a lot off of you. You know, and that includes, for me, that includes doing this show. Because when I do this show, I'm just me. For these two hours every week, the yoke's off. I'm, there's nothing on my shoulders. I'm just able to be who I am with one of my best friends and just talk. And it's fucking fantastic. It's why we've done this for 157 weeks in a row, because this, this is a lot of times and this isn't, this isn't saying anything about anything else in my life, but there are a lot of times this is the best I will feel in a week. And that's not saying that I don't feel good the rest of the week. That's saying I feel better now doing this because it's about me being me. And then there's this group of people for whatever fucking reason likes to listen to me be me and hang out with, you know, one of my best friends just saying whatever we want to say, you know, like yeah. a thousand people most weeks. Like what the fuck dude? But I appreciate that. And this outlet is important to me. Just like going to events, th that outlet's important to me because, again, I get to walk into a room of people and there's no pretense, right? They, they know who's walking in the door. They know who I am. They know they're going to get exactly who I am every fucking time. And yeah, I have good days and bad like anybody else. But at the same time, I know I'm I'm working on maximizing those good days. And I think that's a, the best anybody can do. 
I could also be wrong. I am a fucking idiot after all. I mean, I'm often wrong, so. Oh, got to be good at something, right? No, uh, you actually don't have to be. Turns I, out. Really? Yeah. There's got to be not one a requirement. Thing. Mm. You're probably right. It's just. You would think as a person that has existed for a non-zero amount of time that has through experience gained the cognition required to have coherent and complete thoughts that you'd be good at something. I mean, you would think, and yet well, here we are. Right. And yet Matt Gates exists. Okay. Let's uh, move on to our listener questions. How about that? We only have a couple this week. Um, again, I want to apologize to all of the people that submitted questions for Brian that we didn't get around to. Again, if I could have had a four hour Brian Gottlieb show, fuck, I would have loved to have a four hour Brian Gottlieb show. But that just wasn't a thing. Uh, we will have uh, another, you know, we'll have him on again. And, you know, a great guest, great dude, um, fun conversation. Uh, 10 of 10 would recommend. But we're going to save some of those other questions for for that, you know, for when Brian comes back around. If they're still relevant, we'll move them back to the front of the line. Um, if they're not relevant any longer, we will just, you know, re we'll take take stock of who didn't get their question in and then uh, try to bump them to the front of the line so that they can get a question in. But alas, we'll we'll go a new right now and start with we get we have one listener that sends questions via email. And I think it's the fucking best because it makes me check our email. Um, which is a good thing because I find random surprises in there sometimes. Like we picked up a Patreon, a patron from Norway. That's awesome. Yeah. That's um, unexpected. Wow. Yeah, I know. Right. Um, I'll even say their name here uh, towards the end of the show. But uh, this is from Mr. DBK Shaggy. Uh, so a couple of things he bought. He's new to the uh, Shaggy is new to the game. And had sent pictures of apparently he's got the uh, the new the new player luck going because he bought uh, he started playing two months ago. He bought a box of Uprising and a box of Mist Veil and the box of Uprising had a cold foil Coronet Pink in it and a Marvel Uvia. And then his box of Mist Veil had an extended art uh, traverse. Wow, sure. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Great. Like for the fuck for fuck's sake. Um like that's that's running hot. Like that's running nuclear hot. Uh but he did make sure to send those pictures with the question which I just thought was funny because we had talked about how we don't have cold foil coronet peaks and he kind of struck him as funny. But uh, Shaggy asks, what are the best tools to understand the interactions of cards? I would love if there was a type of app that you can test if something is legal. Example, I only became good at Magic after playing Magic Online, which helped me understand the interactions. I know LSS wants the game to be played uh, in person, but an app or online tool to see if certain interactions are legal or how they would resolve. Thanks again. Um, your best, I mean, your your best online tool right now is probably Talishar.net for gameplay. Uh, they do, it is, the rules engine is actually programmed by judges, um, by flesh and blood judges. So the rules interactions and everything else usually baked into Talish are, are really good and correct. And so that's usually your best bet. There's also the, um, uh, the card database that's on the mothership, which also feeds to February. There is a lot on there. So I would... Uh, if you have a question about a card, a lot of times you can bring it up and it will kind of give um, a little bit of background on it. Um, failing that, uh, Discords. If you pop into our Discord, um, we have judges in there, including the judge in there, if need be. Uh, we also have a ton of very well-seasoned players that understand interactions. So if you have specific questions, that's also a very good place to get them answered. Um, but yeah, those are usually the best tools that are out there. Uh, I kind of need to, I feel like I need to remind people often that, um, flesh and blood's a young game. 
So a lot of times those sort of refined tools like Magic Online, Magic, the Magic Online's beta was Invasion. So that'd be like 2000, 2001 in that general vicinity. At that point in time, Magic was eight years old. So, and I realize that's a different technological era, but we're we're still a young game. And that's important and vital to realize as well. So, um, Charmer, anything to add to that? No, I think that's... I mean, I think that's the only answer, right? It's the best answer. Um, especially if you're looking specifically for stuff on interactions. If you're looking for just like legality, I would say something like February. Um, especially if you're going to use Talishart anyway, just because that feeds into also each other. Yeah, yeah. It has links where they direct feed into each other. So it makes it really nice. But like when you're deck building, if something is, you know, currently not legal or restricted or whatever, um, that just shows up in the deck builder for February. So that's usually my go to. Yep. 100% true. Uh, next question is from Johnny Pastrami. So, you know, it's it's bullshit. Um what is the appropriate length of time to spend in the shower? I, till the till the hot water runs out. Yeah, I mean that is kind of my thought too. I I have this to deal with, you know, and then also I'm a large human, so the 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 time to require to achieve. Um, the the necessary cleanliness is increased i would say 25 to 40 minutes somewhere in that general vicinity cuz then the hot water probably ran out too just throwing that out there what's what's yours do you have a time um i mean honestly it just depends like if i have somewhere to be then my showers are usually 5 to 10 minutes um just for a good head to toe, got to scrub everything. But if I don't have somewhere to be, then I'm going to be in there until the hot water runs out because mm. like I'm old and that's it right. Helps like I've had a lot of injuries and so it just helps everything feel better. And Loosen I don't, up. I don't own a jacuzzi or a sauna or anything like that. So um, my, my tub isn't big enough to like, comfortably do like baths for soaking so when i have what i call like a leisure shower like i'm just gonna be in there till i don't need to be in there yeah that makes sense um i also was asked in chat during world's coverage i just hadn't gotten around to answering it yet uh the question was um the uh my were hair care tips they wanted my hair care routine uh, I mean, honestly, I am in the minority. I have to wash mine every day or it is a greasy mess. Most people don't wash their hair every day, but I have to. Otherwise, it's it's horrible. Um, So I, I do wash and condition the my hair every day. And um, it is I only unless I'm traveling because. I'm not so bougie. I'm bringing my own hair product, but um, when I travel, uh, it's whatever, but at home, it's always Pantene pro V that's my go-to. Um, it does make for, you know, good color, keep soft hair. It does the whole thing. Um, this is actually my natural hair color. This is not dyed. I know when you compare it to my beard, that does not look right, but um, it's my hair is actually Auburn colored it's red ish red blonde and i just the only gray hairs i have are in my beard don't know why doesn't make sense yeah that's fair but that's all there is like this is the gray here and a little bit here that's it haven't gone gray anywhere else yet probably will just not yet um last question this is one that this is a tough one and I didn't think this would be that difficult. But here we are. Uh, Sephiroth asks, what is your favorite song to listen to from Guitar Hero, Guitar Hero 3 Legends of Rock? Minus Cliffs of Dover. What is your favorite song to play 
from Guitar Hero 3 Legends of Rock. Mine is Prayer of the, Prayer of the Refugee. Love it. Rise Against, great band. Or Cult of Personality, a.k.a. CM Punk's uh, entrance music. Um, man, those are some good answers. Um, hmm, I do have the list of songs here. There is no Hoobastank. Just want to go ahead and put that out there. Uh, yeah, so for me, um, just I also have the list of songs pulled up because uh, I I never played Guitar Hero stuff. So, oh, it's actually fun. I mean, I've been around people who have played it. I I've just never done it. No, so sure. my favorite one to play is none. None. Okay. <laughs> um, looking at this list, though, unless I see something that dethrones it, I already oh that one. That one's close, but probably still. All right. So uh, lo- looking at the list, favorite one to listen to from this would have to be Bulls on Parade. It's a um, pretty good one. <laughs> Sabotage is close, though. I love Sabotage. Yep. Uh, I, I would have to go with Bulls on Parade. Yeah. So my favorite. So my favorite to listen to is a toss up. Now, Bulls on Parade and Sabotage are way up the list like they are top fiving but my two that i would go back and forth on out of this list are to listen to are holiday in cambodia i'm a big dead kennedy's guy and then uh paint it black by the rolling stones because paint it black was the theme song to the television show tour of duty which oh, my yeah yeah which my dad watched religiously yeah so sort of a, one of those core memory type things and so i listened to uh, the the songs that kind of remind me of my parents are uh, Reflections um, by the Supremes uh, because that was the opening to China Beach. Um, Paint It Black because it was the opening to Tour of Duty. And uh, House of the Rising Sun by Eric Burden and the Animals because that was uh, the recessional at my parents' wedding. I would like to point out that that is a song about a whorehouse. Um Moving on through that uh, to play in this list, I would have to say uh, there are some really, really good ones in here. I think it's probably The Seeker by The Who and Sunshine of Your Love by Cream because those are both just like really cool um, riffy type songs. And I mean, there's a lot of things that also go up on this list. You know, we already talked about a couple of them, but like the opening to Paranoid is a fucking legend. You know, it's an absolute banger. Um, the Welcome to the Jungle is a classic when it comes to that. Um, yeah, there's just it's it's really hard. Mississippi Queen is another one that I listened to a lot growing up. A lot of people like Knights of Sidonia by Muse. I'm not a big fan. I like that uh, song. It's fine, but it's not like I'm not. It's not. Like, I'm not. I'm not chasing it down. Yeah, I mean, it wouldn't be. It wouldn't. Wouldn't probably even be in my like top five of Muse songs. But I don't. Right. Like I think that's the problem, right? Well, it's like yeah, like Miss Murder is not even my top, probably fifteen of AFI songs. Uh, I have a stack of songs i'm putting ahead i'm putting an entire album ahead of that and so that's like eh, i love afi not necessarily miss murder um i love weezer my name is jonas eh it's fine um anarchy like i don't i'm one of the random punk kids that doesn't really enjoy the sex pistols much um black sunshine is not the white zombie song i'd want uh, it's a great song, just not the one I'd want. Um, one is not the Metallica song I'd want. Um, Raining Blood is probably the Slayer song I'd want, but regardless. Uh, and Story of My Life, uh, I love Social Distortion, and they were one of my favorite punk bands early in life, and I never really outgrew them necessarily. I just found other things to go with it. Um but story of my life has always been one of those where I, I really enjoy the song for the story it tells. And 
that's not necessarily fun to play, but it's more fun to listen to at that point. But it, again, it's I started out with Social Distortion on Mommy's Little Monster, which is their first album from like 1985. And Story of My Life, I believe, is on White Light, White Heat, White Trash, which would have been come out in the mid 90s. So quite a bit different. You know what? Fuck it. I'm going to look that up to see if I'm right. Because um, it is. Nope. It's from their self-titled from 90. Okay. I was wrong. I couldn't remember for sure, but it's a great song. You should, you should listen to it if you haven't. Um, yeah. Derek, I think that's our show for this week. I think you're right. Hmm. I don't see anything else on these notes. Well, that doesn't mean much. Um, I'm not great with making notes that we pay attention to. Um, I had the Patreon pulled up. I just didn't filter it because why would I do that? That doesn't make any sense. So let me get this filtered really quick and then we'll thank some patrons. Um, we'll start with our associate producers, which are Andy, Sindra, Jacob, and the Salty Sea Cat. Then we have our uh, executive producers on up. We have Blaze Storm, value member of the Patreon, Lance Good Thrust, Matt Two Tokes, Pox on us, Sergeant Isbjorn, which I love. It's a great name. Uh, Vintox, congratulations on 18 years. Philip and Rich, if you have any questions, you can go to patreon.com slash flesh and pod. Link is in the show notes. There are some tiers to choose from. I don't know. Um, but any tier will get you into uh, Fap After Dark. Uh, we do have a Fap After Dark that is scheduled for this Wednesday, so December 4th. Um, we may be doing something a little bit different. Haven't tried to work out logistics on that, but we'll see. Um, but yeah. Um, Charmer, where can they find you? Uh, the Discord is the best place to find me. Good enough. Yeah. I'm on, the, I'm on the, uh, the skies that are blue. Oh, there is that. Yeah. So when you want to contact us, um, going forward, you probably just want to ignore Twitter because I'm not posting there. And, um, so it would be searching up flesh and pod on blue sky. We're doing pretty great there. Um, also, you can always go to, uh, you can email us at fleshandpod at gmail.com. I do monitor that now, especially since I get listener questions emailed in. Um, but otherwise, it's it's Blue Sky and, and the Discord are the two best places to contact us at this point. Because Twitter's a dumpster fire. And so while I haven't turned off the spigot over there yet, um, I'm probably giving it end of the year is when we'll just go ahead and flip the switch and say, nope, we're done. That's just part and parcel. Um, it just isn't worth it isn't worth managing anymore. Um, I will probably keep my personal Twitter just because there's a lot of sports stuff on there, but even that's migrating. So that probably won't last a whole lot longer. <sighs> okay, did I miss anything? You think I missed anything? Did I miss anything? I don't think so. No, I think that was it. You should like and subscribe. I should say that in the first 30 seconds, but whatever reason, I just always forget to. Um, but yeah, I think that's all I got. So um, that's 157. I guess we're going to keep doing this. So thanks, everybody, for listening. And, you know, who knows? Maybe we'll uh, be here next week for 158. We probably will. There's no real. No, there's. Yeah, it, it isn't like. Yeah, I fucking hate everything. <sighs> Thanks everybody for listening. We'll talk to you next week because we are masochists. Bye.